Welcome to my channel, Midnight Stories, where you find horror stories that scare you. Before watching, please press like to support me in producing more stories. This helps in spreading the video and reaching more people. Thank you for your support and enjoy watching. I'm proud of it, but it happened. And seen some weird shit in the desert. So when I say that I will not venture into the woods of the Cascadia mountain range alone, it's important to know that the wilderness doesn't frighten me easily. I was 23 years old when a friend of mine, we'll call him Darren, all names are altered, invited me to a camping trip. The site was a place a few miles up a logging road, so about an hour-long hike from an already back-road-as-fuck back road. It was just me, Darren, and his good friend Wade. Place was from the logging road about ten minutes down a trail. The moment we got to the site, I was excited. The small lake was beautiful barely touched by people over the years. It also comforted me somewhat when we got there to see that within the last month at least somebody else had camped out there, extra wood by the fire pit. We ate a bunch of chili and hot dogs, but around dusk the guys went off into the woods and came back with a sealed bucket they had buried the year before, and we opened it up to get into some MREs they stowed in their cache. It was looking to be one of the better camping trips I'd have had in my adult life. That night was a bit different. For the first time in my life I felt an uneasiness sleeping in my tent. I couldn't quite place it, chalked it up to not being used to camping without my dad. Darren brought his .38 special for protection from predators, but he was the only one armed. The next day it rained, as it do in the PNW, and we tried to wait it out but eventually called it quits, packed up and went home. Fast forward to the next year, me and Darren get the itch to go camping again, and I wanted to give that site another shot. I spent a great deal of effort convincing a bunch of my friends to tag along. In the end it wound up being six of us and a big white German shepherd. Me, Darren, Wade, James, Charles, and Rita, James's girlfriend, and Moogie, dog. Knowing about the uneasiness felt the last time, I brought my twelve gauge. James wanted to get some unregulated target practice in, shooting shit they don't allow at official gun ranges, like full cans and gallons jugs. We also brought a quad with us this time, so we could haul a bunch of extra water, booze, and other supplies to make our weekend more comfortable. First day, as we're setting up, we hear a loudspeaker playing some music over by the south end of the lake, which was basically right next to the logging road, and this year could be seen from the road unlike the year prior. So, deciding we're big dick Americans, me and James saunter down to meet the source of the noise pollution. Now, I have to commend the coolness of the cop that was just having a fishing trip, when two large armed men, me with the 12-gauge, James with his .308, emerged from the tree line. We introduced ourselves, mentioned the others, but not exactly where we were camping, just that it was nearby. That's when shit started to get creepy. It could have just been cops doing cop shit, but this guy really wanted to know exactly where we were going to be. Then he was mentioned his favorite spots nearby, and really, really wanted us to try this other spot, two more miles down the logging road. At a point it was almost like he was suggesting that was the only spot where we wouldn't be in trouble. Darren showed up finally, told us that he spoke to the landowner several years ago, and they were fine with us being there. Cop was mad, but we lied and said we'd check out the site he was pushing. None of us trusted the guy when we left, so we decided not to. It was like a horror movie set up. The whole shady cop tells us to go to the spot where his hillbilly friends are going to kidnap us kind of vibe. So we move on, pretty early in the day, so we set up our stuff, get a fire going, float around on our giant four-person inflatable chairboat thing. Biggest highlight of the day. Charles cut down an entire dead tree with nothing but a small axe, like the midway point between a hatchet and a fireman's axe. An impressive feat of stamina and strength. It was a good day leading into a good night, but right after it got dark I felt uneasy again. The first thing that worried me was a couple of us heard something big splash into the far side of the lake. We thought maybe it was Moogie, but he was by the fire, his head now perked up and looking in the direction of the splash. Since we were drunk, we thought maybe the floaty thing might be compromised so we went down with flashlights to pull it out of the water and onto the bank. Then we heard the owl. Charles, Wade, and Darren were already passed out by midnight. Rita was humming along by the fireplace with Moogie, 
and me and James were out getting some more wood so the fire would last. We heard an owl start up its hooting, a cadence I was familiar with in the area. But something was off about it. I have a gift for mimicking bird noises, so what I noticed immediately is the ending hoot was off. Almost always sounds like the owl is rolling its R's as that final hoot of the sequence goes. James, not nearly as outdoorsy as me, says, that almost just sounds like a person. We joke, listen to it a couple more times, then I do my own attempt at an owl noise. Silence. For a few minutes. Just as I'm thinking that makes sense because of the noise. It starts up again, but not just one owl. Another started up about half a second after the first. The new owl sounding more like an actual owl than the first one that seemed to have started up again. And after the first hoot from real owl, the fake one stopped short. Did that owl just tell the other owl to shut up? A little James says to me. I decide to shout, Better listen to your wife, dude! Immediately after I shout, we both hear a loud crashing, almost identical to the sound of the tree falling that Charles did earlier that day. Moogie starts to go fucking berserk, barking and growling. He had a stink gland issue at this point still, so he was releasing that nastiness as well. He was threatened, and luckily Rita was there to keep him from bolting. Big as he was, if he really wanted to move, she wouldn't be much of an obstacle. I'm about to shit my pants out of fear. I will reiterate for effect. I have hunted mountain lions and bears in my life, and at no point during those hunts was I as shaken and genuinely afraid as this. I was paralyzed for like an entire minute. Whoever that is, you better fuck off. We have plenty of guns, I shout across the lake. Then silence again, luckily for the rest of the night. I didn't fall asleep until Darren woke up, basically at sunrise. So I missed breakfast and a morning dunk in the lake the others all did before I got up, needing to poo real bad. James had already explained the noises to the others by time we all were ready for our different adventures. Darren, Wade, and Rita just wanted to listen to the radio and chill. Moogie had run off just after lunch, and we decided to go look for him while also investigating the area of the noises last night. Almost immediately, when we get to the other side of the lake, the hair stands up on the back of my neck. Charles also feels creeped out, but he had an axe, I had a shotgun, and James had his rifle and his .45 holstered on his hip. So we pressed onward, looking for probably a couple of hours. I was mainly trying to see if we could spot any trees that had fallen. Then we made it to the eastern bank of the lake. We were camped on the western side. Holy shit, Charles says, causing me and James to come rushing over. There we saw what looked like a human footprint. Just one, but it was very clearly a footprint in the mud, even had a little pool of water still in it. My first thought was Bigfoot, so I took off my boot and compared sizes. I am a huge guy with pretty large feet so it wasn't a surprise that my clodhoppers dwarfed this footprint when I put my own print down next to it. But what was weird was the other print, where the pinky toe would be, looked like another big toe was there instead. We also found several downed trees, but none that looked recent. So we decided to go around the north of the lake and back to the others, doing a full circle. Moogie was fine. As soon as food smells filled the air, he came running back, and we all had a pretty good day again drinking, feasting, and making fun of each other for being paranoid. We heard some gunshots a little close and then called out to warn the shooters that there were people and animals nearby. The shooters of us actually went to meet the people and all of us, but Darren and Wade joined the old guy and his wife shooting at whatever we could. Part of me consciously thought, anything that was lurking around sure us fuck isn't now. Boy, was I wrong. A brief mention about Charles. Ever since we were kids, Charles has had vivid night terrors. Most of the time funny, some of the time scary. He'd full-on sleepwalk and have conversations with you while still asleep. We had all gone to bed. I was one of the first due to getting like four hours of sleep and being quite rum drunk. Hey, who's that? Captain, stay in your tent. Charles, who was sleeping on a tarp by the fire instead of in a tent, started shouting. I shot up, grabbed the shotgun, and turned on my flashlight. What's wrong? I shout, adrenaline filling my entire existence. I could feel my heartbeat pounding in my ears. Come closer to the fire. No, don't crouch down, motherfucker. Use your words. He keeps shouting, finally stirring awake James and Rita, who were in the tent closest to Charles. What the fuck? 
James calls out. Moogie starts growling and apparently let off the stink gland again in their tent because him and Rita are like, Ugh, Moog, gross. There's somebody sneaking up on Captain's tent. Get out here. I start to unzip my tent. Not you, Captain. Stay in there. He's right next to you. Everybody else to this day denies hearing this, but I swear I heard something whisper Captain before hearing a twig crunch right outside my tent. James makes it out of his tent, and seconds later I hear him laughing. It's just the water stump. Charles is just having a night terror. Charles claimed he wasn't dreaming, but when I got out and shined the light on the stump, he agreed that that had to be it. We put one of those big jugs of water on top of a stump. It could easily be mistaken for a white shirt standing in the dark. Satisfied that there wasn't actually anything there, despite my protests, we all went back to bed. Charles stayed in the tent for the rest of the night. I decided to spend the rest of the night on watch. That was one of, if not the most, terrifying nights of my life. I heard more activity in those woods than I had ever heard before. Moogie would wake up and borf multiple times as I'd hear twigs snapping off in the trees. Then I heard a really big snap that had to have only been about ten feet away. I jumped to my feet, whipped over to where the noise was, and shined my light. I've seen enough deer ass in my life to know what I saw running from me. What is not normal of deer, however, is they don't stand the fuck up and run on their back legs. Moogie howled and snarled. I took aim, letting my light drop and fired. I didn't care that it turned to run. I fucking unloaded. Boom after boom after boom, until I ran out of all six shells I had loaded. Everyone else was freaking the fuck out and rushed out of their tents. I told them what happened and nobody went back to bed until the morning. Nothing else happened that night. I think Moogie refusing to leave the tent was what allowed the others to take me seriously enough. He was a brave dog, sweet, but if mean dogs fucked with him at the park, he knew how to throw down. The last thing that happened on that last day, Darren and Wade went to go bury the bucket after putting some fresh new supplies in it. They had always known where the cache was buried because there was a different stump that they used as a landmark. That stump was just... gone. It was there when we retrieved the cache two days prior, but now it was vanished. No signs of it being uprooted, dragged, or disturbed. It simply was as though it never existed. We all thought we made a mistake, until we found the hole for the bucket, still dug, and with the little poncho stuffed in it. Well, I'm never coming back here now, so we may as well take this with us, Darren said, and we all left after lunch. That is why I will never even go hiking in the Cascade Wilderness without a firearm, and at least two other people who know how to use them. TLDR. Creepy noises causes paranoid idiot to shoot at the darkness. Evidence suggests he wasn't so paranoid. I'd been living in my house for about a year before the knocking started. It didn't happen often probably once every six, eight weeks. There would only be one or two knocks each time, and they always came from the woods behind my house. I never got a close-up view of what made them, and what few glances I managed were always obscured by trees or other cover. It was broadly sized, a solid dark color, and appeared to stand upright. I nicknamed it Whoop, because that's exactly how the weird call it seemed to make sounded. I definitely heard its whooping more often than the knocking. I'd always try to answer, but could never get another reply. Now I'm sure what you're thinking, and before all this happened, I never thought or knew much about things like Bigfoot, ghosts, or the paranormal. And to reiterate, I still don't know what whoop even is, because I never got an actual clear visual. If anything like that existed, I thought it just added more mystery to this world. I came out here to live a quiet, simple life. I don't want fame, attention, or publicity, and figured Whoop wanted the same. Provided we kept our boundaries, I thought the two of us could have a peaceful coexistence. Shortly after the knocks began, my garden and animal pen started getting raided at night. It only happened once every so often, but something would pillage my crops, fruit trees, even steal one or two of my farm animals. My garden and pens can keep out animals of all sizes. This was the first time I ever had problems. But since whatever was doing this still managed to slip in and out with ease, I quickly realized it was whoop. 
I tried using trail cameras to catch an image of it and as a potential deterrent. It worked at first, but Whoop eventually found a way around the cameras, and if it had to, smashed or knocked them off their posts. After this happened a few more times, it became evident that Whoop's nighttime visits occurred on the same days I heard the knocking. Discovering this correlation made me pay closer attention to the details of Whoop's nocturnal marauding, which made me notice another pattern. It always either ransacked the garden or animal pens, and never did both on the same night. When I aligned the number of knocks heard each time, and which section was subsequently raided, another pattern became clear. One knock meant the garden, two meant the pens. The knocks, I thought, have to mean it was hungry, and whether it wanted a carnivorous or herbivorous meal. The next time I heard Whoop's knocking, I put that theory to the test. It was a single loud knock that came around dusk and was actually followed by a quick whoop about fifteen minutes later. One knock should mean the garden, so I filled a bowl with fruits, vegetables, grain, nuts, and laid them out on a large flat rock about twenty yards into the tree line. I was hoping an offering like this could be my way of letting Whoop know I understood its message, and it would in turn stay out of my garden. Sure enough, it worked. I saw no signs of any disturbances in my garden the next morning, and everything I left for it on the rock was gone. This became my protocol whenever I heard the knocking, and it worked every time. Then a few months later, my boyfriend Jesse moved in with me, and the knocking stopped. Nothing happened for about five, six months, and I figured Whoop must have left the area. I told Jesse about the knocking and offerings I left for Whoop. Naturally, he was skeptical about it, and when nothing happened those first few months after he moved in, it was hard to not blame him for thinking I was crazy. Then, out of nowhere, the knocking resumed. I was sitting on my back patio one evening, admiring the diamond necklace Jesse surprised me with when he came home earlier that day. It had a silver chain and heart-shaped diamond charm that was light pink in color with gold edging and glimmered wondrously in the sunset's rays. I actually jumped upon hearing the knocking, clear as day, and coming no more than fifty feet from inside the tree line. I should have been delighted to hear a sign from Whoop, but something was oddly different about these knocks that just didn't sit right. This time there were three. There was more than just hair in that clump. It was an entire human scalp. I sprung into the living room to get Jesse and spilled onto the floor upon entering. I could only frantically point towards the kitchen's back door and sputter panicked gibberish until Jesse managed to calm my nerves by firmly holding me in place. They're out out there. The, the patio is something. I couldn't even make complete sentences. Hair? The, the hair? Jesse looked more confused than worried. He got me onto the couch saying he'd check it out, but wanted me to stay put until he returned. I heard Jesse open the kitchen door and step outside, where he remained for about five minutes, which to me felt like hours. I was flooded with relief upon hearing Jesse step back inside and make his way down the hall, but he gave me an answer I didn't expect. There's nothing out there, Jesse said as he re-entered the living room. What exactly did you see? Despite what he said, Jesse's face had almost no color and he wore this flustered, petrified expression, looking like he just saw a ghost. The worry on Jesse's face made me feel horrible for scaring him like this, but there was no disputing what I saw. Jesse, when I went outside, there was a clump of hair out on the patio, I shakily replied. Not just hair, but an entire human fucking scalp. It must have... was... placed there by... something. I brought up calling the police, but Jesse quickly interjected. What are you going to tell them? The thing that lives in the woods behind my house put a human scalp on my back patio, then took it back? Jesse asked with a noticeable tinge of sarcasm. Even if they don't think you're crazy... They can't do anything without proof. And according to you, it vanished. Jesse wasn't fond of the law, but he made a point. Despite my reluctance, I went back outside with Jesse to poke around, but found no trace of a human scalp. It was moved, I thought. There was only one animal around here that could have done it with such impeccable covertness, and if that was the case, the prospect of it being able to get that close without me knowing still keeps me up at night. When I checked the offering rock, Nothing I left out was touched, which made me even more unsettled. Jesse tried convincing me I mistook it for something else, but again, I knew what I saw. 
Jesse managed to put me down for a nap later that day. It was dusk when I woke up, and despite regaining some composure, I felt no less on edge. The house, I noticed, contained an eerie stillness. I called for Jesse, but he didn't respond. I went downstairs and found a note from Jesse in the kitchen, saying he had to make an emergency shipment for work and would be gone for a few days. Jesse was a truck driver and traveled a lot, so last-minute jobs springing up like this weren't uncommon. I tried calling his phone, but it went straight to voicemail, which also wasn't unusual since the reception outside of town was subpar at best and stayed like that for quite a while. Nonetheless, I was now completely alone in this house and at a time when the last thing I wanted to be was by myself. I thought about leaving, but it was already dark, and I didn't even feel comfortable venturing beyond my front door. Before going to bed, I made sure every light in the house was on, and any opening or entrance was closed and locked. Remarkably, the night passed without incident. Although the next few days were uneventful, I still couldn't get in touch with Jesse. Whenever I called, his phone kept going to voicemail. Although he claimed not to find anything, the expression on Jesse's face that morning said differently. I feared Jesse actually saw the severed scalp, maybe even caught a glimpse of Whoop, and was so spooked it made him leave. Most of his belongings were still here, though, and it was too uncharacteristic of him to be so unreachable, so I was assuming the worst. While trying to make sense of Jesse's abrupt departure, I continued obsessing over Whoop's gruesome gift, and a few days later the questions I had about it were answered. The police showed up one morning and said they had to use my backyard so they can access a crime scene in the woods behind my house. Turns out some hikers stumbled across five bodies at the bottom of a ravine about one mile away from my house. Investigators said the bodies were initially buried, but got dug up by some sort of large animal. It not only exhumed all five corpses, but apparently ate and dismembered large sections of their bodies. I was certain Whoop committed these grisly killings, and my suspicions were confirmed after seeing a photo of one victim. Her name was Heather, and she'd been missing for about two months. She had a pretty face with gleaming green eyes and beautiful dark brown hair, which contained a prominent pink highlight streak. That human scalp I found the other day, it belonged to that woman. But then the case took a different turn. Despite the body's battered conditions, investigators managed to identify all five victims. They were mostly prostitutes, junkies, and drifters. They were all from different parts of the country and had no connections to our town or surrounding area. Autopsies revealed every one of them died by strangulation and blunt force trauma, which to me still implicated whoop. There still had to be some sort of underlying connection explaining why these victims wound up here of all places, and I found that link when looking at the picture of another victim. When I saw it, my feet almost buckled. The necklace this woman wore in her photo, silver chain with a heart-shaped light pink diamond and gold edging, was the same one I got from Jesse. Whoop didn't kill those people. It was Jesse. I went to the police and told them about the necklace, but didn't say anything about the human scalp. They searched my house and found a stash of random items belonging to all five victims, which they said were probably trophies Jesse kept as mementos, likely as a way to remember the murder. I never heard from Jesse again, who's still at large. Detectives think he could also be behind some other unsolved disappearances and murders that happened in spots along his trucking route and are still investigating. Once I put the pieces together, it painted a macabre picture. Jesse, my boyfriend, killed those five people. He must have encountered them along his trucking routes and brought the bodies back here to be buried. It's unclear if Jesse held them captive before killing them or did it immediately and hauled their corpses around both of which are equally disturbing scenarios. Looking back at the day Jesse left, I think he did see the human scalp and disposed of it himself after realizing it came from one of his victims. Jesse did flee, but only to avoid getting caught. Whoop was the catalyst behind his departure, but not because it was trying to protect or give me a warning. It just wanted to eat. Whoop must have come across Jesse's burial site on its own or following Jesse during one of his drop-offs. This also made me realize what three knocks meant. It was hungry for human meat. After eating those bodies, Whoop must have developed a taste for human flesh, and here's why I'm certain that's the case. 
One night last weekend, a solo camper went missing in the same stretch of woods behind my house. On the same evening of her disappearance, I heard three loud knocks coming from the woods. Careful, careful, don't let him spot us. Jackson whispered to me as I aimed down the sights of my brand new hunting rifle. We'd been set up inside this old deer blind of his for about four and a half hours now, without any sign of life other than ours nearby, and I was just about ready to call it a day. But right then, as I was getting ready to pack up and go back to the cabin, much to Jackson's disappointment, our prey walked into our sights. He was a big old bastard for sure, and looked like he had some good cuts of meat on him. This was my first time hunting large game before, so Jackson wanted me to be the one to take the shot. I quietly got into position and aimed. He was an older one and completely oblivious to us both. I was hoping to get him with a good broadside to the chest and hit him in the heart or lungs. That way, he wouldn't get very far. But if I missed, we'd have to spend the next day or so tracking his ass across the Alaskan wilderness if we didn't want to go home empty-handed. Not very appealing considering how Alaska holds the title for the state with the highest number of missing persons, especially around here. With Jackson quietly coaching me on in the background, I did everything as we had practiced, controlled my breathing, steadied my heart rate, and visualized the shot. Finally, when I was ready, I slowly squeezed the trigger. Bang! The sound of the rifle broke the silence of the forest. I saw him jerk as my bullet tore into his side and both Jackson and I could hear him let out a pitiful, pained grunt before he started to run. As he ran, I could see hot air steaming out of his side when he breathed. I, I got him, I shouted joyfully. Jackson was ecstatic. Good fucking shot, Mike. You got him in the lungs, it looks like. Come on now, let's get after him. We both climbed out of our deer blind and began to follow the trail of blood and stomped down foliage. I was so proud of myself. To think, a year earlier, I had never hunted in my life. I was a city boy, you know. Dad was a big shot lawyer back in Philly, so he was busy most of the time. And Mom hated the woods, so I had never even gone so much as camping. But that all changed when I met my friend Jack. He came to work at the same office as me about two or so years ago but we had never really talked until my bitch of a boss put me on the same project with him. I was worried at first because he had a reputation for being weird. He never talked to people if it didn't have anything to do with his job, always keeping to himself. Most people found it creepy, but I just figured he didn't want to get involved with the bullshit of office politics. Nothing wrong with that. Some of the guys in the customer service department had even started a betting pool that eventually worked its way around the office to try and figure where he was from or what he did before he worked here. I joined in for the hell of it and paid the fifty-buck fee. The winner would get close up to two thousand dollars. People tried and tried to make small talk with him, ask him questions, get to know him, but every time he shrugged them off or ignored them entirely. I didn't think he appreciated the fact of being made a game of, I suppose I would have been a bit pissed, too. I talked with him a few times while we were working together and actually managed to get a laugh out of him with a good dirty joke. That old Gene Tracy joke about Hurricane Gussie. That was more than anyone was able to do in the past two years, so I was making headway for sure. But what made him really open up to me was that day in the lounge when he started to warm up his lunch. It was a thing of brisket with some BBQ sauce. It smelled so damn good. It made the soggy microwaved hamburger I had in my hand seem like it was inedible. I complimented it and asked where he got it from. He was sort of surprised at first when I asked him, kind of like people don't ask him that question much. I was expecting he was going to say he got it from some overpriced BBQ place nearby, but when he said he made it himself, I was curious. That's when he said he was a pretty big hunter, and he got that meat from some elk he killed down in Wyoming last fall said he had a whole freezer full of it back at his apartment. That was the first time he had said more than a few sentences to me. And once I started showing interest and asking him questions, he seemed genuinely happy to finally talk to someone about it. He even offered to split his lunch with me. Normally I would have turned it down, but I was hungry, and he insisted. And it tasted so fucking good. He smiled as I eagerly lopped it all down. You really like it, don't you? He said with a grin. I could only nod my head as I was making a total pig of myself. There was something about it, 
I had never tasted something like it before. It was sweet and more tender and had something to it I couldn't put my finger on. I offered to pay him for a box of it since he said he had a freezer of it back at home, but he gave it to me for free. He said he never minded sharing with friends. He brought it to my house that Saturday, and by the time the weekend was over, I had eaten all of it. I had taken a few online cooking classes before, so I was using it in all sorts of dishes and meals, a few I shared with Jack. He was impressed by what I could do with it and asked me just as many questions about cooking as I did him hunting. We kept talking more and more while we worked on the project. Apparently, before he worked here, he served in the Army. He laughed when I asked if he was some kind of special forces operator or something like that, saying the only thing special about him was that he was a slightly better shot than most others. That's when he asked me about the office pool on him and what it was at. I was kind of nervous at first because I thought he'd be angry knowing I was in on it, but he just laughed when I told him it was at the 2000 mark. He joked that he would have been upset if I wasn't in on it and agreed to tell me everything I needed to know about him so long as I split the money with him. The next day we were both a thousand bucks richer. I think that's when you could really say we had become friends. After the project was finished, we still hung out with each other, went to bars, watched movies, stuff like that. But our conversations always turned back to hunting, the way he talked about what went into it, how much skill it took, and the feeling you got when you finally took down your prey after stalking them for the whole day. I was fascinated by it. He saw my fascination with it, and it didn't take long for him to ask me if I wanted to go hunt moose with him in this place he called Tongass, Alaska. I looked at him with a raised eyebrow at first upon hearing the name. He pulled a pamphlet out for me to read. Tongass National Park. 16.7 million acres of beautiful remote wilderness. At first I just told him I appreciated it, but I'd never even gone camping before, much less go out on a hunting trip to the middle of nowhere. That's when he offered to teach me. He said he could see in my eyes that I would make a good hunter because I had the want to. Despite some inner reservations I had, Jackson eventually convinced me, and I agreed to at least try it out. Besides, we had a few months before hunting season, so we had time to prepare. Contrary to what I had heard on the news, it was harder to get a gun than I thought. But Jack helped me through the process and taught me how to use it proficiently. At first I practiced on bottles. The first time I shot a rifle I wasn't ready for the kick or noise and nearly fell on my ass. Jack just laughed a little and told me not to worry about it. The second time I was ready for the kick, but I still missed the shot. But the third time I hit the bottle. It was a small achievement, but it seemed like walking on the moon to me. Once I had mastered shooting at bottles, he moved me onto clay pigeons, and after that, it was time for live targets. My first kill was a rabbit. I blew it away with a shotgun. Standing over its dead body, I felt something I had never felt before. Power. True power. It was like a high, almost. Jack patted me on the back when we went to grab its corpse, and he said he was proud of me. When I asked if it was normal to feel good after killing something, he laughed a little. Well, Mike, most people wouldn't call it normal. As for me, I prefer the term uncommon. He went on to say he felt the same way as I did, and was glad I did too. We went on a few more small hunting trips to prepare for the big one. Birds, more rabbits, wild pigs, foxes, and a few stray animals as well. And when the time for the big hunt came, I was ready. We pooled our money together to book some plane tickets to Alaska and hunting cabin for us to stay at and we both took time off work. On the flight there I was anxious and eager for my first big hunt. Jack could see it in my eyes and he was happy. Happy to finally have someone to hunt with rather than just going by himself like every year before. It was a very long flight and it took us a while to reach the cabin. Along the way we met a nice old man, probably around sixty years old on the trek there. He was old but healthy for his age and very energetic. We shared some small talk before we went our separate ways. His daughter had apparently paid for him to go on this trip. One of the things on his bucket list, he said. When Jack and I finally made it to the cabin, we were both exhausted from the trip and decided it would be best to spend the night resting for tomorrow. The cabin was old, probably built in the 50s. It had only the bare necessities for a small group of hunters, a gas stove for cooking and a freezer for storing meat. Fortunately, it had plenty of firewood stocked up for us, 
so we had a decent flame going on inside the fireplace before the sun went down. As Jack and I sat in that old, dimly lit cabin, eating cheap gas station beef jerky together, he could see the disappointment in my food. You see, ever since that day when Jack so generously shared his lunch with me, store-bought meat and fast food might as well have been garbage. I couldn't stomach the shit. I couldn't even enjoy a burger anymore. That night Jack brought it up and said he had a confession to make. I listened as he began to explain his diet, so to say. Mine, too, I suppose. That meat he had given to me that day, and the days afterward, was not elk, nor deer, nor pig, nor cow, nor anything of those sorts. He was sorry for not telling me the truth, but he was scared I wasn't ready yet. I didn't know how to respond, a norm. A common reaction to being told this would be disgust, anger, and revulsion. But my reaction was uncommon. It was more surprising than anything. After some more talking, I told Jack I forgave him and thanked him for introducing me to all of this. We both got some good sleep that night. And here we are today, tracking after my first big kill. He ran a little further than we thought he would, but he was healthy for his age after all. That's one of the reasons Jack picked him. We followed the blood trail a couple of hundred yards down the hill. We knew we were close when we found his rifle on the ground. The old bastard should have kept it on him. He might have stood a chance, but people don't think right when their lungs are filling with blood. After a little more walking, I heard Jack exclaim, There he is. Sure enough, I could spot his bright orange hunting vest. It's kind of funny, they're meant to keep you safe, but it led us right to him. He had collapsed on the ground and was wheezing every time he breathed. He was trying to crawl away, but it was no use. Jack and I proudly strolled up to him and flipped him on his back. His tear-filled eyes looked up at me with pure terror and confusion. He tried to beg and plead, but he was struggling to speak. Wh why Why are you, you doing this? I felt like God himself as I stood over this pitiful dying man. Neither Jack nor I responded. I didn't hesitate to raise my rifle again and put another round in his forehead, blowing out the back of his skull. Jack was right. I did enjoy it. It was the biggest rush I'd ever felt in my life, and I wanted more. Both Jack and I yelled out in celebration of our kill. Normally hunters would pose and take a picture with their kills, but given the circumstances, it would be best not to. Damn, Mike. That was a good fucking kill. Reminds me of my first. Come on, now we gotta haul his heavy ass back to the cabin before he starts to stink. I will say the kill was the best part. I didn't much enjoy having to carry him all the way back to the cabin, or the nasty business of butchering him. But when we were done cutting him up, we had a freezer full of meat. Jack was a pro at this. He always picked out his targets before killing them. He told me he had spotted several potential targets as we met with the other hunters on our way here, the old man included. He hated smokers and drinkers, said their meat didn't taste right. That's why he doesn't hunt in the cities. Homeless people taste like trash, he said. This one didn't drink or smoke, and though he was older, his meat was tender. We used the fireplace to burn his clothes, useless bits, and his wallet after I took all the money out of it. I also kept the picture of his daughter he had in it as a little memento. He was the only human we killed there. Any more than one or two people would draw suspicion from the law, and we didn't want that. When we reached civilization again, I used the money he had in his wallet to buy the spices and sauce we'd used to season and marinate him. After a whole day of cooking, Jack and I dug into a nice roast we made out of his right thigh. It was mouth-watering, even better than before since I was the one who made the kill. I sure had the time of my life there, and when the season ended, Jack and I wrapped up our spoils and brought it back home with us. We ate like kings for weeks. Brisket, blood sausage, burgers, steak, roast, everything we could think of. And after smoking his back straps for a while, we decided to be generous and shared it at the office Christmas party. It was a hit with everyone there, especially that cute girl in HR. Jack and I are already making plans for the next hunting season. I just hope our freezer stock will hold out until then. We've already eaten through half of him, and after sharing some of him with our office colleagues, we might have to get an early start. On the bright side, though, Jack says a few of the new guys might make good hunting buddies, too. Who knows, maybe one day we'll be able to start our own hunting club. I can't wait. Two years ago, 
a bunch of my friends and I went on a school-sponsored trip to Alaska set up by the Pursuit Institute. I was placed in a group with nine, no, ten other students and two adult chaperones. Another group was also made up of similar numbers, and each group would start at one location, and then we would switch places halfway through. The trip would consist mostly of hiking and backpacking in Denali, where we would camp in tents, and then hiking near the Kenai Peninsula, where we would stay in a cabin. We arrived in Anchorage at about two o'clock in the morning, but it was still light out as Alaska never really got dark that time of year. Our groups parted ways after claiming our baggage, and my group began our trip by driving to Denali National Park, where we would be spending the next several days. We all had a great time, and before we knew it, it was time to meet up with the other group and trade places for the second half of our trip. We converged in front of a supermarket, and the two groups swapped stories and shared some laughs. It was all fun, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was... wrong with the other group. Their stories would be incredibly vague, or they would just stop halfway through as if they caught themselves from mentioning something without even realizing it. It was all incredibly eerie, but no one but me seemed to notice. When I tried to question them further or go into detail about their trip, they would simply become dazed and say that it was really all just a blur. Then, getting defensive, they would ask me details about our trip so far. I scoffed and tried to remember a specific event, only to find that I really didn't remember much either. In fact, as I began listening to my group's own stories, we were being just as vague as them. It was all so strange that no one, not even I, immediately noticed that the other group was short one kid. Suddenly, though, it hit me. Where's Josh? I asked the group. Everyone turned to face me. Their eyes seemed glazed and cloudy as their faces reflected my own confusion right back at me. What they said next made my blood run cold. With such genuine seriousness that it couldn't have possibly been a joke, one by one they asked, Who the hell is Josh? Even the adults looked puzzled. Giving a nervous laugh, I turned to my own group for support, only to see that they were looking at me with the same expressions. Confusion was plastered across every one of their faces, looking at me with blank eyes. Then suddenly, confusion turned to laughter as if they realized that I had been joking. Ha ha! Nice man! You had me going for a second there, Matt said as the mood quickly lightened back up. I laughed with them and pretended that it had been a joke, but all I felt was a horrible sickness rising up inside me. That's when a kid from the other group said, Ha ha, but seriously, what's with your group? You guys are acting all weird and where is Sarah? Ha ha, very funny. Yeah, real original. Members of both groups snapped back at him almost in unison. No one named Sarah had even been in our group, and even I was pissed that he was making fun of me. That is, until I saw the look on his face. When no one took him seriously, his appearance was bleached to a deathly pale tone, and his eyes widened, shifting from side to side nervously. Then he looked at me. Our eyes met, and we both knew that something was horribly wrong. Although we couldn't really be sure that the other was telling the truth, we both seemingly knew someone who was now forgotten. We simply stood there for what felt like forever, staring at each other. He looked horrified. I'm sure I did, too. Before I got a chance to talk to him, however, we were shoved into our separate cars and were on our way to our new destinations, their group to Denali, ours to the cabin. I doubted talking to him would have done any good anyway, though. What could either of us have said? He didn't remember Josh, and I sure as hell didn't know anyone named Sarah. The more I thought about it, the more I began to convince myself that it must have been a joke by everyone to screw with me. A group joke that everyone was in on except for me. Josh was probably just hiding in the car, laughing his ass off. I felt like such an idiot for believing that another kid had experienced what I had, when he was really just flat out mocking me in front of everyone. I buried my face in my hands. Part of me was angry, but I was mostly relieved. It certainly made more sense to think that it was all just a joke on me. I was actually impressed that they'd got the adults in on it too, but overall I was still pretty pissed, and I decided that the next time I saw the kid who mocked me, I would punch him straight in the face. How dare he mess with me by making up someone? Sarah Duffy, yeah, right? Yeah. My mind froze. Duffy? 
He had never said a last name. Where did I get that from? And why did it sound so familiar? What startled me was that I even had a face to put with the name. My mind suddenly exploded with pictures and memories. Sarah. She was my best goddamn friend. How the hell did I forget about her? I was clutching my head and gasping for air as everyone in the car looked at me and began yelling for me to calm the hell down. I couldn't calm down, though. My mind felt like it was being smashed with a sledgehammer. And the more my memory cleared, the worse it got. Pain, the likes of which I had never experienced before, racked my body as I curled into a ball, shivering and straining to maintain consciousness. The memories continued rushing back into my head, threatening to split my mind in two until suddenly it was over. I sat up and bleary-eyed looked around me. Everyone stared right back at me, terrified. Guys, Sarah, Sarah Duffy, please, dear God, tell me you remember her, I practically screamed. Their faces once again switched to anger. God damn it, John, one of the adult chaperones yelled. We thought you were having a Caesar or something. If you pull one more stunt like that for the sake of a joke, we'll send you straight home. Are you okay? What the hell was that? I began tearing up. You guys don't know Sarah? She, she was my friend. She was your friend, for Christ's sake. I began searching for a specific memory. Kevin, you made fun of her goofy hair right when we got off of the plane in Anchorage, I cried. Please, for the love of God, tell me you remember that. No one said a thing. They all just stared at me with judgmental expressions. That joke has run its course, Kevin said coldly. Not one of them showed any signs of recognition, but I knew she was real, or had been anyway. What the hell had happened to her? I strained and tried to remember the last time I had seen her, but any recent memories were still elusive and blurry. No matter how hard I tried, all thinking about it did was bring back the headaches and pain. Finally, I was forced to stop or everyone would begin to seriously worry about me again. I just sat in the car for the next several hours of the drive and stared out the window at the bleak gray surroundings as rain ran down the glass. It had been raining since we arrived in Alaska and it showed no signs of letting up for the next couple of days at least. Finally, we arrived at the entrance to the trail that would take us to the cabin the other group had stayed at. We unloaded our packs, strapped them on, and set out on our seven-mile hike to where the secluded lakeside cabin lay. It was about two o'clock in the morning, but since it never really got dark out, our plan was to hike in immediately and get there by five o'clock so as to have a full day ahead of us. That being said, however, the constant rain and low-set clouds made for poor visibility, and the hike in was a struggle, to say the least. Through the thick fog, it was near impossible to even make out a tree branch before it struck you in the face, seemingly out of nowhere. Being mindful of possible grizzly bears, we took care to keep our group loud so as to scare them off. About an hour in, we were all singing Journey at the top of our lungs, when I suddenly fell to my knees and then collapsed to the muddy ground, clutching my head. I had once again been trying to remember when I had last seen Sarah, when it all came flooding back in a horrific wave of grotesque images and unimaginable terrors. There we were, at the Denali campground. The torrential rain pelted down, and the sky was so dark that for the first time since we had been there, it actually seemed like night. Everyone was settling down under the tarp around the campfire, and many people were already asleep in their tents. That's when Jenna asked if anyone had seen Sarah, as she still hadn't washed her dishes. I'm pretty sure she went to bed already, I said. I don't want to be creepy, but I'll go check to be sure. I reluctantly walked away from the warmth of the fire and into the oppressive darkness and driving cold rain. As I approached her tent, I could tell that she wasn't inside as it was unzipped with the door lying wide open. I immediately ran to close it. What an idiot, I thought to myself. The tent is completely soaked inside now. That's when I heard her muffled, agonizing scream. It came from somewhere in the woods surrounding the campground, and I, without thinking, immediately ran off into the forest after her. After shoving my way through thick spruce and willows, I reached a clearing where I could barely see Sarah's body on the ground as some thing, which was mostly obscured by trees and underbrush, was ripping her open. She was screaming with all of her might, but the thing's bony hooked hand was covering her mouth. Its long fingers curled almost all the way around her head. 
The sound of her death was horrendous as bones snapped and skin was peeled away. I wanted to help, but couldn't bring myself to move. Sarah was long dead by the time I realized that the creature was beginning to wear her. It had hallowed her out and was now sewing her lifeless corpse onto itself. I was still paralyzed with fear when it suddenly turned towards me. Sarah's grotesque shredded carcass was now horribly reanimated, and it began crawling towards me like some kind of broken marionette as her dead eyes looked straight ahead yet saw nothing. I finally broke out of my trance and began frantically sprinting back towards camp. Sarah's corpse could have easily caught me crawling, but the thick underbrush forced it to stand up awkwardly and begin a demented walk in which everything moved all wrong. This, fortunately, gave me enough time to reach the safety of the campfire, although when I arrived I had no idea what I had been running from, or really any of what I had just done. No one asked me if Sarah had really been asleep, because none of us knew a Sarah. And that thing, pretending to be her, cringing at the light of the fire, slowly slunk back into the dark of the forest. I bolted upright to people yelling, cursing, and struggling to their feet. I had been near the front of the group, so when I fell to the ground, many people behind me tripped over my body and then tripped the people behind them. Oh, God, I'm sorry, you guys, I cried. The, uh, the ground is really slick here. Grumbles were heard and several insults flew my way, but we all eventually got up and continued moving. My mind was racing. The fact that I could remember Sarah when no one else could must have had something to do with seeing the creature before it stole her skin. For me, it must have just been the initial shock that caused the lapse in memory. It was for this same reason that I could remember Josh while the other kid didn't. My blood froze. He didn't remember Josh because his memory had blocked the horror from him, because he had seen Josh being taken in the exact same area in which we were now hiking, and our bear calls were bringing it right to us. Breathing heavily, I slowly turned my head around to look behind me. Sure enough, following from quite a distance and just barely visible in the bleak gray fog, I could see the silhouette of some sort of fucked up human impersonation, grotesquely stumbling along just behind our group, wearing the decaying face of Josh. Its limbs swayed and bent in directions impossible for a human to imitate, and there were seams where the skin split away and was held together with nothing but a few fleshy strands. When the creature saw me looking, it darted away off the path, but I could tell that it was still following us. It was waiting for something. I doubted it would attack us with such a large group, and I was sure that no one would believe me, and so I was forced to simply continue hiking. Finally we reached the cabin and everyone tried to get some last-minute sleep before we started our day. Everyone but me. I knew that thing was sulking around in the darkness of the woods surrounding the cabin waiting for one of us to go out alone. Morning came and everyone quickly prepared for our hike of the day. We would be hiking up a mountain which required some intense bushwhacking just to reach the base, thus realistically making the trip at least four hours both ways. We packed our lunches, consisting of nothing but protein bars and water, and zipped up our rain gear as the weather was still nothing short of a downpour. The sky remained a depressing gray and light thunder could be heard rumbling in the distance. That's when someone said what I had been dreading. The worst-case scenario. Ashley stepped forward and apologetically said, Sorry, everyone, but I feel just terrible. I think I'll stay behind on this one. You guys go on ahead. I'll stay here at the cabin. No, I cried. You have to come with us. We have to stay together. Everyone turned and looked at me. Jesus, John, if she's not feeling well, let her stay, Pam scolded. Ah, I stammered. That's not it. I just, uh, fine. I'll stay too. You don't have to do that, John. Ashley said, I'll be fine here alone. No, you won't. I wanted to scream, but I had to calm my nerves. Nah, I didn't want to go on this dumb hike anyway. I laughed. You guys have fun, though. Everyone looked at me weirdly and then glanced at each other before shrugging and heading off into the woods. I wasn't sure if we would be any safer with just the two of us, but what else could I have done? We would just have to buckle down inside the cabin and hope for the best. As soon as the others disappeared out of sight, I turned to Ashley and said, All right, we need to get inside the cabin now. I appreciate you staying with me and all, but you're kind of freaking me out, she said. Ha ha, sorry, I awkwardly laughed. It's pretty damn wet out here, though. 
We should really go inside. Yeah, that's a good plan, she said slowly. I better lay down for a bit. That's when I saw him, or it, standing twenty or so feet behind Ashley, Josh's decaying corpse horribly stretched and disfigured in order to cover whatever thing was wearing it. Ashley saw me looking and turned around to let out a strangled squeak. What? What the fuck is that? She screamed. I said nothing and simply grabbed her arm, taking off running to the cab and slamming the door behind us. The thing didn't run after us, rather. It began slowly walking towards the cabin. It knew we had nowhere to go. I locked the door and scrambled to barricade it with anything I could find. Now there was nothing to do but watch its demented impression of a person as it crawled ever so slowly towards the door. Its hands dragged along the muddy ground and its fleshy skin hide swayed ever so softly as it staggered. What the hell is that? Ashley kept repeating over and over between her ragged breaths. I, I, I don't know, I stammered. I just don't know. What does it want? She screamed as it reached the door and tried the handle. I assume it wants a new coat, I said through clenched teeth. She drew a breath and fell to the ground before looking up at me, horrified. The thing moved away from the door and now stood a few inches behind one of the windows, staring in at us. Its cold gaze could be felt from behind the dead eyes of Josh's face, and we could hear skin widening as it smiled. It was messing with us. Ashley broke down and began weeping. Leave us alone, she cried. Get the hell away. The thing did nothing and simply stood there motionless. Then it slowly lifted up one of its hands and began lightly rapping on the window. Knock, knock, knock. A slow, steady rhythm. It had no intention of breaking the window or anything. It just wanted to let us know that it was there. Not that we needed the reminder. I couldn't take my eyes off it. This continued for several hours as the sunlight slowly faded and the rain and wind picked up. Soon the sound of it knocking was almost drowned out, and I was having to strain to see it in the dim light. Heavy sheets of water whipped around and obscured its form. At one point I let my eyes wander for too long, and when I looked back, it was gone. The knocking had stopped. I bolted upright just in time to barely catch a glimpse of it disappearing around the side of the cabin. This is bad, I said. I think it's tired of waiting. Ashley let out a squeal and buried her face in her hands. I wasn't sure if it could get in from somewhere else, but it clearly knew something we didn't. It's okay, I said, thinking fast, trying to pep-talk myself more than anything. All we need to do is wait for the others to get back. They should be here any minute now. Who? Ashley asked. The rest of our group, I said. Kevin, Lauren, Pam, those guys, remember? I... I don't know who you're talking about, she stated, looking at me puzzled. It's always been just the two of us. My heart practically stopped, and as I sank to the ground in despair, I began to hear knocks all around the cabin. Hey all, let me start out by saying I live in Massachusetts. Normally people think one of four things location-wise for M.A. Boston, Cape Cod, Salem, and the rest. The rest I have taken to calling spooky woods. This is about some spooky words in western Massachusetts. I bought my house almost exactly a year ago. It's a two-story brick square that was built in 1920. A lot of people think it had a commercial use before it was used as a house. It's almost 500 feet away from the road with a gravel drive that I and delivery peeps don't much care for. I've seen a couple things out of the corner of my eye, like a brown cat. The only thing my cats have ever alerted me to has been a mouse in the walls. But the most important detail is my backyard is woods. My backyard is a conservation area, so it won't ever be developed into housing. I've seen bears with cubs, deer, bobcat, opossums, owls, and lots of other little critters. I've heard even more, which brings me to an event that happened about a couple weeks ago. Actually, thinking better of it, it happened at the end of autumn when my partner found a fairy ring of mushrooms and not only stepped into the middle but also poked every mushroom there. Thanks, darling, why not just leave the door open for the fae to show up? Anyway, since he's played with the fairy circle, I've kept an ear and eye out for weirdness and pretty much said to the woods that his prodding was not an invitation inside. Then winter came and it got cold here and still is. On this night a couple weeks ago, it was about 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, the temperature was a single digit but my phone said it felt like 3F. 
Both me and my partner wake up together, for no real reason that we were able to figure out. We have neighbors to the sides of us, but they're quiet at night. One side has an HOA and is pretty much silent as death after 10 p.m. Our other neighbor is right by the road. We acknowledge that we're awake to each other. One of the cats is very excited we're awake and wants to cuddle. We're unsuccessfully trying to push him away when we all hear it, whistling. It was so light that the cat's purrs were able to block it out, but he stopped purring and we all heard the whistling in the woods. It was a jaunty little tune, like someone enjoying a stroll, except it was ridiculously cold out and it was coming, from the woods. It only lasted for a few seconds and then the cat went back to purring and blocked out if it went longer. Haven't heard it since. Part of me likes to think it was a happy custodian in the high school that I can sometimes just barely hear the loud pep rallies of, but the larger part knows I call these spooky woods for a reason.